Be Our Proud presents a candid conversation on black distrust of American medicine. Now your host, Dion Guillory. Welcome to Candid Conversations. I'm your host, Dion Guillory. February is Black History Month, and of course, in traditional fashion, you probably expect tonight's show to focus on honoring the trailblazers that paved the way for all of us. However, we're still battling the COVID-19 pandemic, so we thought we'd share the history of health as it relates to the black community. For years, history has proven to show disparities in health, but just how deep do those go? We'll share a timeline of important health moments from history and explain why many black people just don't trust the healthcare system, especially in times like this. This is Candid Conversations, Black Distrust of American Medicine. Some of you may think every show starts with a reference to slavery, but that's because that was the beginning of life for many black people. So this is definitely the case where health is concerned. So listen to this. According to history.com, from about 1525 to around 1866, nearly 12 and a half million slaves were taken from their homeland and shipped across the Atlantic. While aboard these ships, diseases such as measles, smallpox, influenza, scurvy, and dysentery ran rapid. In 1783, during the trial of the Zong, it was discovered that within two months, 62 of the 442 slaves aboard and seven crew members died to the spread of disease on board. Now, Captain Luke Collinwood, he was the one who feared about the financial burden from this because he could lose a lot of money due to the number of slaves that died due to disease on that ship. And those deaths were not covered by the ship's insurance, but slaves who drowned would be covered. So to avoid the spread of disease, Collingwood had some 133 slaves thrown overboard, stating it would slow the spread of disease. Now at the trials between the owners of that ship and their insurance company, the owners argued that because it was legal to kill sick animals for the safety of the ship, it was legal to do so with the slaves. And the court agreed with that argument. Now moving on to the Civil War, an article on CivilWarMed.com states that during the war, there were separate wards for wounded black soldiers in the Union Army, and they were poorly staffed. Black soldiers would die from wounds that white soldiers would recover from due to a lack of supplies and treatment, which is a common message here. Statistics show black troops were susceptible to everything from smallpox to lung infections. They died at almost twice the rate of white soldiers with a 5% mortality rate compared to 2.9% among white soldiers. Smallpox was six to seven times more prevalent among black soldiers than whites. Scurvy was five times higher and lung inflammation and bronchial diseases were two to five times higher. Death rates from syphilis were lower for black soldiers than for whites, but acute diarrhea was higher in black soldiers. Now, blacks continued to be used in medical experiments without consent, dead or alive. And so that takes us to this one, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which so many black people know about the history of this. It was an unethical natural history study conducted between 1932 in 1972, and this was done by the United States Public Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So listen to this. The purpose of all of this for this study was to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis. So what they did, they got 600 African-American men to participate in this study by telling them that they were receiving free health care from the federal government, the ones who got the disease, they were never told about their diagnosis. None of the infected men were treated with penicillin, despite the fact that by 1947, the antibiotic was widely available and had become the standard treatment for the disease. The 1972 a worker there, his name was Peter Buxton, he was the one who leaked the information on the Tuskegee experiment to Gene Heller of the Associated Press. Now Heller's story exposed the experiment and it was published on July 25th, 1972. The experiment ended shortly after. In 1974, study participants received a portion of a $10 million out of court settlement that was divided into four categories. Living syphilitic group participants received $37,500. Their heirs received $15,000. Now, living control group participants received $16,000, while their heirs got $5,000. Now, while those settlements were issued in 1974, there wasn't a public apology until 1997. And that came from President Bill Clinton. Listen to this. What was done 
cannot be undone. But we can end the silence. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look at you in the eye and finally say on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful and I am sorry. The last study participant, Mr. Ernest L. Hendon, died at age 97 on January 16, 2004. The last widow receiving benefits died on January 27, 2009. There are currently 11 offspring receiving lifetime medical and health benefits as a result of the Tuskegee experiment. Next up, we have the story of Henrietta Lacks, born Loretta Pleasant. Henrietta Lacks was a 31-year-old African-American mother of five from Virginia who died of cervical cancer. Medical researchers cultured and used her cancer cells and named them the HeLa cell line. They have been used to study the effects of toxins, drugs, hormones, and viruses on the growth of cancer cells without experimenting on humans. The HeLa cells were used to develop the polio vaccine and in cancer and AIDS research. Doctors never got Lax or her family's permission to culture her cells. They did so using a roller tube technique while her body was still at the hospital after her death. In 2010, Rebecca Skloot published The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, a compelling look at Lacks' story, her impact on medical science, and important bioethical issues. That book became the basis for the HBO film by the same name starring Oprah Winfrey, which was released in April of 2017. John Hopkins University released a statement after the release of Skloot's book. Listen to this. The publication of Skloot's book led John Hopkins to review our interactions with Henrietta Lacks and with the Lacks family over more than 50 years. At several points across those decades, we found that Johns Hopkins could have and should have done more to inform and work with members of Henrietta Lacks' family out of respect for them, their privacy, and their personal interests now, they later said, we are deeply committed to the ongoing efforts at our institutions and elsewhere to honor the contributions of Henrietta Lacks and to ensure the appropriate protections and care of the Lacks family's medical information. Sloot created the Henrietta Lacks Foundation in 2010 to help families that underwent medical experiments without consent. And now all of that brings us to where we are now the COVID-19 pandemic. We have been dealing with this virus that changed everyone's world for almost a year now. It is a contagious disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. The first case was identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. The disease has since spread worldwide, leading to an ongoing pandemic. Louisiana's first case happened on March 9th, 2020, and it changed all our lives in this state forever. While the virus has affected many, the most shocking numbers are those that show how black people have been affected. We have seen the cases increase by the thousands and black people have died disproportionately from this virus. Underlying health conditions have been said to be the biggest cause. Some of the biggest ones have been hypertension, diabetes and heart disease, conditions that hit African Americans harder than any other group. New studies are showing that vitamin D deficiencies may be another culprit that is either claiming the lives of blacks or leading blacks to be placed on ventilators at higher rates. Now there are some doctors who aren't so sure about that because the studies looked at COVID patients who had an underlying health condition which could have caused them to contract the virus. But if you do have a vitamin D deficiency, doctors say it is not a bad idea to take vitamins. All right, coming up, we've been battling this COVID-19 virus for nearly a year, and now there are several vaccines. We'll explain when you could have a chance to get yours. And also, we're talking maternal mortality. Did you know the maternal mortality rate has previously been high for the state of Louisiana? At one time, we ranked in the top 10. We will talk with one expert about this to see how the state is planning to turn those statistics around. Welcome back to a candid conversation on black distrust of American medicine. Vaccines for COVID-19 are here and they started rolling out in December. The first shots went to frontline healthcare workers. The state has several phase tiers to let people know who qualifies 
at the current time to register for the vaccine. So let's talk about the vaccines because the very first one to get emergency use approval was the Pfizer vaccine. The Food and Drug Administration gave it the green light in early December and shots were delivered just days later. The FDA called Pfizer's vaccine safe and strongly protective. The doses were scarce and had to be rationed between healthcare workers and people living in nursing homes. Hospitals and other facilities were given ultra cold freezers those hold doses of the Pfizer vaccine because they need to be at temperatures colder than 94 degrees below zero. Now, one note about this is that the shot requires two doses 21 days apart. Now, about a week later, the Moderna vaccine was given emergency use approval by the FDA and the FDA panel. FDA analysis has found the vaccine to be 94.5% effective. People in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, and staff were the first to get this vaccine. First responders, such as firefighters and EMS workers, have also gotten this vaccine. And like the Pfizer shot, the Moderna one requires two doses, but this one those are given about 28 days apart. So there is a process on how the vaccines are being rolled out because the supply just can't meet the demand. The people who qualify have been expanded to include people 65 and older, law enforcement and other first responders, and some election staff ahead of the March elections. For the full list, you can go to our website, brprod.com. There's also a list of vaccine locations in your area, but you just can't show up to that location. You have to pre-register because once again, the supply can't meet the demand. We've heard of some people having to get on waiting lists and having to wait quite a while, but once you're on that list, you're in line and you're good to go. For a full list of all of those locations, all you have to do is just go to our website, that's brproud.com. Now, one thing that makes it harder for people to be comfortable with taking the vaccine are the number of medical professionals who received the vaccine. One local hospital system has stated that more than 50% of its staff has not taken the vaccine due to misinformation about the vaccine on the internet. This leaves many to ask the question across the state, why should I take the vaccine if medical professionals who are administering the vaccine aren't even willing to? Well, that's surely some food for thought. And of course, we're going to break that down even more later on in this broadcast. So just think about that as we take this break. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed implicit biases when it comes to minority health, especially for black people. This alone is one of the primary reasons so many African Americans are afraid to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Joining me to discuss implicit biases, historical health care skepticism, and why taking the COVID vaccine may just be the thing you need is Southern University Professor Dr. Sharice Nelson. Dr. Sharice Nelson, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I am excited about this conversation, so let's start with uh, the mention of implicit bias. Uh, explain to people at home who don't know about it what it is and how it has been seen with COVID-19. Absolutely. So when we talk about a, a implicit bias, what we have to understand is that it's really organized around this idea of racism and the idea that racism has like these four different layers, right? There is institutional racism, which means that the institution was erected and started with race with racist ideas in mind. Mm -hmm. There's systematic racism where there are systems that are in place that help to keep um, the furthering of, of certain races versus other races alive alive and well. There's this internalized racism where we believe um, stereotypes about other people because of our, our racial upbringings or what we've seen. And then there is um, there is the eternalized, goodness gracious, and, and and then there is the one where the interpersonal, okay. where we where we use it interpersonally. And when we think about the interpersonal piece, that's where we see the the, the implicit bias show up, mm -hmm. is in this interpersonal piece where where uh, I believe you to be a certain way because of the relationships I've had with you. Black people have a reason um, to be skeptical of the system, but the thing that I think that we have to uh, kind of zoom in on um, is that. 
that the uh, African American woman responsible for the rollout of this coronavirus, uh, his name is Dr. Kamikia S. Gr uh, yeah. Corbett. Right? She's Dr. one of the vaccines. Yeah. Right. She, Dr. Kamikia S. Corbett is from Hurdle Mills, North Carolina. Right. She's from a rural community that knows what health disparities look like up uh, up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And so I think the difference right now historically is that we have a voice at the table. It doesn't mean that racism is gone. It doesn't mean that implicit bias is gone. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be cautious. But to the level of fear that we that I often see in the community, I, I think is in some ways unwarranted. Yeah. yeah so Southern right now has uh, partnered with Care South um, to and and we are getting the Moderna vac uh, vaccines. Um, we have just concluded with um, all of our uh, everybody in the Allied Health uh, the School of Allied Health being vaccinated so that we can start reaching out to the community to become vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I know that we are vaccinating people on campus as we speak. Uh, and so we should see a surge in that uh, here late in February. Dr. Cherise Nelson, thank you so much for uh, just bringing us insight on this. So a very important conversation. I'm glad we were able to have it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and if you would like to know more about Dr. Cherise Nelson, you can head on over to our website, brprov.com. We'll be right back. During the mid-1800s, surgeon James Marion Sims became known as the father of modern gynecology for developing surgical techniques that help women through a difficult childbirth. Sims created his techniques by operating on enslaved black women without using anesthesia because he believed black women didn't feel pain. He experimented on enslaved black women in a makeshift hospital behind his house in Alabama. He then later founded the Women's Hospital in 1845. In the 20th century, Sims' work was condemned as an improper use of human experimental subjects, and he was described as a prime example of progress in the medical profession made at the expense of a vulnerable population. Sims routinely operated on nine slave women, of which only three are known to have survived. They survived multiple attempts to fix their condition of a vesico-vaginal fistula, and although Sims was able to close the fistula, small perforations remained after healing, leakage continued, and often the sutures became infected. It wasn't until the 30th surgery that Sims found a solution to help one of the women. It is believed that Sims was exaggerated, and he exaggerated those conditions of the women to gain a competitive edge over his colleagues. It is also noted that several colleagues decided they no one longer wanted to assist him in his procedures due to the excruciating amounts of pain the women were faced with. Slave women were forced to take turns holding each other down during surgery. Statistics show that black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than any other race. Joining us now to talk more about this is Dr. Veronica Gillespie Bell. I want to make sure I get that in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she is the medical director for the Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, we talked before and I was, I was saying how this is such an important conversation to have. Uh, before we even get into the, the questions we already have prepared, mm -hmm. we were talking and you were saying that this is such an issue even before COVID. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, we talk about COVID-19 and it being a pandemic and it's a public health crisis and that is true, it is. But so is maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. And so is the disparity of deaths that we see amongst black women nationally and here in Louisiana. That's a public health crisis as well. Do you know why the rate is so high? So there are so many factors that are contributing. Um, my belief and looking at the data, implicit bias and structural racism are at the root. Mm -hmm. um, we know that even when we adjust for socioeconomic factors, looking at severe maternal morbidity, and morbidity is a precursor for mortality, mm -hmm. that even when we adjust for socioeconomic factors, black women, especially a black woman with a college degree, is twice as likely to experience a severe maternal morbidity compared to a white woman with a high school education. Wow. So when we adjust for social determinants of health, which I'm not saying social determinants of health do factor into the outcomes, but even when we adjust for those social determinants of health, we still see a disparity in our outcomes 
And so that points to the differences in how we deliver care. Mm -hmm. And those differences in how we deliver care are related to our implicit bias. Right. And just for background, she is a practicing OBGYN. Yes. So she <laughs> is really knowledgeable about this. Uh, so you're part of this collaborative. Yes. Um, what does the collaborative do? So the Perinatal Quality Collaborative partners with hospitals um, as well as patients, um, community advocates, um, working in our birthing facilities to make sure we are treating every patient every time, meaning we have readiness in place and we have response systems in place for the leading causes, the leading clinical causes of maternal mortality, and that's hemorrhage and hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, so we work as a collaborative with our birthing facilities so that we all learn from each other and we use improvement science so that we're building quality capacity in these facilities so that they can start to make sure they have processes in place and structures in place to make sure we have better outcomes. Dr. <laughs> Veronica Gillespie Bell, thank you so much for coming in and talking about this extremely important conversation that may have gotten on the back burner because of the pandemic, but our goal here is to bring it back to light. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us for Candid Conversations on the Black Mistrust of American Medicine. We hope that tonight's discussion has left you informed and armed with the information to make sound decisions about your health. The conversation continues in just a few moments with my colleague Jonah Gilmore. So head on over to our website, brproud.com, for Color Crossroads right now. I'm Dion Guillory. Good night.